parents of a little girl killed in a brutal attack are now in a battle over custody of her body. Tonight, what the father is doing to try to take his daughter back to California. A downtown casino is facing federal labor charges. We'll show you what has Binion's horseshoe in trouble. Plus, see the new plans to stop lions, tigers, and cheetahs from crossing state lines. And why one Nevada lawmaker says the rules need to change. And later, George Knapp shows us how the Las Vegas water worries will change your life and your lawn. You're watching Channel 8 Eyewitness News, the news leader. Christiana Cowan was just three years old when she was stabbed to death in a brutal attack in Mesquite last week. Now the little girl's body is at the center of a custody dispute between her mother and her father. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Christiana's father is trying to take his daughter's body back to California for burial, while her mother wants to have the funeral here in Nevada. Channel 8 Eyewitness News is live. Atlee Erlingson is at the Clark County Courthouse with more on this sad custody battle. Atlee. Gary, good evening. I first met Christiana his father last week. We had a lengthy sit-down interview together and he told me that he was going to do everything in his power to make sure that Christiana goes back to California with him and that she's buried there. Today he filed those court papers which now ultimately takes the decision of where she will be buried out of the hands of the parents and puts it into the hands of a judge. Three-year-old Christiana Cowan lived the first few years of her short life in Southern California. But when she died from last week's stabbing in Mesquite, an immediate dispute erupted over where she should be buried. Her mother, who moved here just five months ago from California, wants to bury her here in Nevada. But her father, who still lives in Southern California, says he wants to bury her there, where Christiana's grandparents and other family members call home. Christiana has been stopped from going back to her home where she spent most of her life. Uh, we're trying to rectify that uh, by using the proper, the proper civilized system. William Errico is the family's attorney, filing this emergency injunction Friday afternoon, along with Christiana's father and family members. This to prevent the mortuary from releasing Christiana's body to her mother, ultimately turning the decision over to a judge to decide where Christiana will finally be laid to rest. The family needs to be able to say goodbye and a proper and appropriate religious service needs to be able to occur back home where uh, Christiana is from and the body basically needs to be returned back uh, to its home. But where will that home be? While little Christiana lies waiting, her mother and father will battle through the courts to decide her final resting spot. The main argument that Christiana's father will use in court is the simple fact that Christiana's grandparents and most of her family still live in California. In fairness to Tammy Bergeron, who is Christiana's mother, we have given her several opportunities to talk to us on camera. However, at this time, she is simply too distraught to talk to the media. The question now is how long will this court battle last? Will it be days or weeks? I posed that question to the lawyer earlier today, and he simply didn't have the answer, but he did say that he hopes the courts will expedite this process. Atley Erlingson, Channel 8 Eyewitness News. News live. What a sad situation. Yeah. Atley, thank you. Christiana's half sister, 10 year old Brittany Bergeron, survived that attack. She's expected to stay at University Medical Center throughout the weekend. She has been moved out of intensive care and into a regular room. When she's released from the hospital, she will go to a long term care facility. The district attorney and a district court judge here have signed the governor's warrant to bring the suspects in the stabbings back to Nevada from Utah. It's now on its way to Carson City to get a signature from Governor Kenny Gwynn. One of downtown's oldest casinos is facing accusations from non-union employees and the National Labor Relations Board. Channel 8 Eyewitness News is live. John Summers is downtown with the latest. John. Paula, that's a federal complaint. That's one more piece of evidence pointing to apparent financial problems at Binion's Horseshoe. Those financial problems are now having a dramatic effect on employees trying to get health care. This complaint was filed by the National Labor Relations Board based on charges filed by the Culinary Union in November. It alleges Binion's Horseshoe has been engaging in unfair business practices, broke agreements with the union, and stopped paying employee health care insurance. Union employees can still get medical care under the union's health care. Non-union employees aren't so lucky. Joni Blyler's husband quit his job at the Horseshoe in August because Binion's deducted money from his paycheck but wasn't paying the bills. He went to the manager there and asked him why he was getting collection notices 
and was explained that they were behind in their payments, but they would help him get it all caught up. Blyler says that never happened, and her husband is now working in Alaska. She says because of Binion's, she may now not be able to buy a home. We pulled a copy of our credit history, and out of 15 marks, 14 are from medical companies, all from where Metaversal hasn't paid the bill because Binion's hasn't paid them. She hopes the latest development is the first step of many to solve her financial problems. Becky Bainan declined an on-camera interview again today, but I did speak with her on the phone, and she told me she knew nothing about the, the complaint being filed by the Labor Relations Board. Nonetheless, it is scheduled to be heard later on in March. The Department of Labor, meanwhile, is continuing its investigation. That's one that will likely be more effective for non-union employees. There's no word on when that investigation will be complete. From downtown Las Vegas, I'm John Summers, Channel 8 Eyewitness News Live. Thank you, John. Law enforcement and community leaders are reacting to results of a study released today on racial profiling. The study shows that black motorists are stopped at a rate higher than drivers of other races. Channel 8 Eyewitness News reporter Carol Wilkinson has the story. A newly released study suggests that Nevada law enforcement officers stop black motorists at disproportionately higher numbers than other races. So Terrence barriers. Johnson is a community a activist like who has looked at the study's but results. The study uh, is, uh, is questionable in terms of its numbers and the proportionate number of African Americans and Latinos who who've been stopped by uh, the police department. According to the information released by the state attorney general's office, the findings show disparities in traffic stops. White drivers, 60% of the population in Metro's jurisdiction, were pulled over by police 55% of the time. Hispanics and Asians were stopped at numbers closer to their population figures, while African Americans, 9% of the population, were stopped 15% of the time. And figures from the Nevada Highway Patrol indicate that while whites make up 65% of the state's population, they were stopped 73% of the time, while African Americans, making up nearly 7% of the state's population, were stopped 6% of the time. While not pleased with the figures from his department, Sheriff Bill Young says the study only accounts for 12% of the work officers do every day. My thought was that the rates would even be higher. I was a little bit surprised that they weren't. That's after 24 years of experience. My guess is if we did this study 20 years ago, it had, the numbers had been far higher for disparity. I think we have, as a profession, have improved in this particular area over the years. But the sheriff says there's still room for improvement. He's establishing a community-wide advisory board that he says will seek out suggestions from the community and help Metro improve both its image and its working relationships with the citizens it serves. Carol Wilkinson, Channel 8 Eyewitness News. The study was required by law. Its results have been delivered to the state legislature. For a complete look at the report, you can log on to our website at klastv.com. Channel 8 and Eyewitness News will be your source for complete coverage when the legislature opens in Carson City on Monday. All next week, I-Team reporter George Knapp will be in Carson City with live reports on the big issues. That's starting Monday on Channel 8 Eyewitness News. More charges have been filed against the owners of a dog grooming business where 50 dogs were found living in deplorable conditions. Today, 33-year-old Graham Pickett and his 32-year-old wife Dawn were charged with failure to provide proper sustenance, overdriving, torturing, or injuring animals, and failure to maintain animal sanitation. The Picketts owned Artistic Pet. Police seized 50 dogs from the dog grooming business three weeks ago. They say the dogs were living in unhealthy conditions without food or water. The couple is already facing multiple charges in relation to being allegedly a part of an auto theft ring. U.S. Senator John Ensign wants to make it more difficult for private citizens to own exotic cats, such as lions, tigers, and cheetahs. He's introduced a bill that would outlaw the shipment of exotic cats for the purpose of keeping them as pets. Channel 8 Eyewitness News reporter Casey Roebuck has details. Hi. Well, hi there, young lady. Oh, what a good girl. Yes. Good Hope is just one of more than 120 animals that make their home at Keepers of the Wild, an exotic animal band. refuge near Boulder City. Executive Director Jonathan Kraft says many of these animals were once pets. These animals are not pets. I just wish that the public would understand that animals are not pets. These are very dangerous predators. Senator Ensign's Captive Wildlife Act would make it illegal to take big cats across state lines. 
More than half of the big cats here at Keepers of the Wild were once kept as pets and then were unwanted. The lucky ones wind up at places like this, but for others, their future is uncertain. Many are abused or neglected because private owners do not care for them properly. He was beaten, in, beaten into submission and consequently did a lot of uh, trauma to his eyes. And that's why he is, uh, he's almost totally blind. In a statement released by Ensign's office, he says the practice of owning exotic animals is extremely dangerous, both for the animals and the owner. As a veterinarian and a senator, I support this legislation because it protects the public and ensures the animals get the best care possible from certified trainers. Kraft says if the and, legislation uh, becomes law, it will not here. solve the problem yeah. completely, oh, but it will help give authorities boy, the tools to keep animals are, out of the wrong hands. Casey here. Roebuck, Channel 8 Eyewitness I, News. I, 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 the Captive Animal Safety Act would not affect exotic cats in shows, such as those in Siegfried and Roy's show. It would only prohibit the transportation of large cats for pets by private owners. Well, it doesn't seem much like the end of January. At least it doesn't feel like it outside, Kevin. This is the dead of winter. Can you believe it, Gary and Paula? No question about it. The weather headline today, a record high temperature. Let me show you the top temp from McCarran. The mercury max out at 75 degrees, eclipsing the old mark that's been standing for 32 years, 16 degrees above normal. And not only did we have a record high temperature for the day, this was the warmest January ever recorded. And by the way, if you take all the highs and lows, throw them in a hat, Average them out. The previous record was back in 1986, 51.7 degrees. We annihilated that record, 54.3. And while 3 degrees may not seem like a huge difference, it is. It's very rare to break a mark by 3 degrees when you have to take in 31 highs and 31 lows. We'll show you how warm it was in your neighborhood today and also the big change as we get into the weekend, too. And it is a big change. That forecast is upcoming, Gary and Paula. All right, thanks, Kevin. This warm weather has been a double-edged sword. While we've all been enjoying the warm temperatures, they have some running for the allergy medicine. Channel 8 Eyewitness News reporter Luann Sorrell talked to both sides today. Gorgeous. All my friends back east have zero weather, so I'm, I'm happy. It's beautiful, hot, sunny. It feels like summer. It appears that spring has sprung early here in the valley. These are already starting to bud already. People like Wensom Sutherland are at Plant World Nursery already picking out plants to put in their garden. I have plants that didn't even go dormant. They just, they kept growing. That's okay, according to Clark Clevenger. He says most plants that didn't go to sleep for a long winter's nap, and most of those that are coming up early, will be just fine if there's one last cold snap. If it gets cold enough at night, um, but during the day, you want to go out and cover your, your, your vegetables and your fruits with like a uh, burlap. Cooler weather is what allergy sufferers like Lorene Meyer are hoping for. She says her allergies have been worse than normal. A lot of headaches, your, face, your nasal passages get swollen, your face gets swollen. This is the earliest that I've seen it happening. And unless Mother Nature graces the valley with some cooler temperatures to stunt early pollen production, Dr. Katz says allergy sufferers should brace themselves for lots of sneezing and wheezing. Luann Sorrell, Channel 8 Eyewitness News. Dr. Katz says there is a bit of good news for people this year who suffer with allergies. The antihistamine Claritin is now available over the counter, so you don't have to go to a doctor to get a prescription. Rush hour is coming to an end, but there is a big jam at I-15 in Russell. That's where Victor Woodall is live in Chopper 8. What's going on, Victor? Paula, that's the only thing we to talk about this evening. Take a live look now from Chopper 8. You can see the long line of lights and cars as people from the 215 are getting off to the 15 northbound. You can see in the center of your screen there. This is going to start around Russell as the slowdown and continue on through Spring Mountain. Over on the 15, we're looking good. We did have an earlier accident on 15 up there near Apex that has cleared. That's not affecting traffic. And the 95 is also up to speed this evening. That's your eye on traffic for now from Chopper 8. I'm Victor Woodall, Channel 8 Eyewitness News Live. Thank you, Victor. Well, you can't live without water, but your lawn may have to give it up. George Knapp will be here to show us why water worries could change the Las Vegas lifestyle. And later in this hour, a coroner's inquest into a police shooting of a robbery suspect is over. We will tell you what the jury decides. And a new laser treatment may help senior citizens who are losing their eyesight to dry macular degeneration. You're watching Channel 8 Eyewitness News at 6 with Paula Gary Waddell, Neighborhood Weather with Kevin Jennison, and Sports with Chris Matthews. Channel 8 Eyewitness News, the news leader.
Could water shortages finally put an end to Southern Nevada's relentless growth rate? Some critics think it's inevitable, but water officials think that's just doom and gloom. Nearly all sides do agree that our community is long overdue for a serious program of water conservation. Our per capita water use may be the highest anywhere, even now during an extended drought. George Knapp of the I-Team joins us with a look at just what's coming down the pipe when it comes to water. George. <laughs> Gary and Paula, local water officials estimate the average flow of the Colorado Colorado River over the past 100 years is about 15 million acre feet per year. But if you look at the bigger picture, say four centuries of tree ring records, some experts think the real average flow is about 10 million acre feet, which would mean we've been living far above our means water wise. Either way, all sides seem to agree that conservation of water is a key to Southern Nevada's future. The spigot is finally being squeezed. A three-year drought along the Colorado River has left communities like Denver literally high and dry and resentful of the excesses of Las Vegas. The profligate displays at strip resorts, the rampant growth of greenery and golf courses, man-made lakes and curbside rivers. Our per capita water use is by far the highest in the Southwest. Despite a conservation program launched years ago, our consumption per person continues to climb. Even water honchos concede that conservation has fizzled. We have fallen short in the last two years achieving the conservation that this community committed to do. Fallen short may be putting it mildly, as evidenced by rampant water waste seen in every part of town every day. We should be embarrassed as a city, as a, as a, as a metropolitan area, by how much water we use. We use so much more than other desert cities. We should be shamed into uh, conservation measures. Warden says the message has certainly sunk in with some developers who know that if they want to continue to build and sell homes, strong measures need to be taken. Now, Summerlin, he says, took steps from the beginning, planting drought-resistant foliage in common areas, for example, at a time when rival builders were creating near rainforests. Now, with the drought, stricter conservation could become a matter of business survival. We're looking at now really stepping this up, kicking it up a big notch, and uh, looking at how we can even minimize turf more and uh, bring in even more drought tolerant plants and low water use plants than we have so far. So we're trying to raise the bar on this whole issue. One option in Summerlin, getting builders to offer water smart homes comparable to energy efficient models. But voluntary measures alone aren't likely to cut it. Water officials have announced our first ever drought plan to cope with current conditions along the Colorado. Critics say these steps should have been taken 20 years ago, along with design constraints on builders to stretch out our long term water supply. Water officials have been successful in finding new sources of water for us to tap, such as distant Coyote Springs, and they banked water underground in Arizona. But there's been a reluctance to discuss the G word, growth. It's conceivable if you're, if you're dealing with a fixed supply of water, yet you're adding more and more users to that same water source year, year after year, sooner or later it's got to result in lower supplies for every household every business, every casino, and so on. Paulson alleges that elected officials on water boards do the bidding of casinos and developers in keeping the growth engine churning. If you ask water officials about growth, they don't seem to acknowledge a connection. I don't think so. I mean, do we have a 100-year supply of food? <laughs> there needs to be no limit on our growth. I don't think limit. water should limit your growth, right. no. Unlimited. We can have an unlimited number of people in this valley because we've got is that what, what you mean? I think if you continue to manage water and develop these options, if you want to pay for it, you probably can garner water resources. We have known for some time already that the Colorado River Basin is essentially running dry here. In Southern California, water officials see it differently. They started planning for this day long ago, first by dramatically cutting per capita use, then by taking growth issues head on, and by banking huge amounts of water for a not so rainy day. And while much of the Southwest was rationing this year, because we have such a diverse portfolio of water supplies, we didn't find ourselves in that predicament. In an extreme case, we, we are aware, historians are aware, that there have been uh, several civilizations that have collapsed due to lack of water. 
Uh, by no means are we predicting Las Vegas will dry up and blow away, but Mark Bird and others say when you factor in the additional uh, global warming, the drought we're in now could be the norm in the long term. If we're able to conserve, either through much higher water rates or through other means, such savings would mean Las Vegas could continue to prosper for many years. And you heard Kay Brothers say, if we're willing to pay a price, we can probably always go buy more water from someone. Brace yourself, though, Southern Nevada, because by this summer, we'll all see evidence of just how bad the water situation is. Your bill is going to go up, and your water use is going to have to go down. If you want more information, you can link on to our website at klastv.com. So the water officials you talk to don't see a time when they might have to say no to additional housing development? Nope, nope, never. That, at least what we were told, except that it already did happen a couple yeah, of years ago. About 10 years ago, Pat Mulroy if you'll recall, issued no serve orders to developers yeah. because at the time we couldn't guarantee uh, s sufficient supplies of water. That went away in a hurry, though. As far as our officials are concerned, uh, land, land may end up limiting our growth, but water won't do it. Hmm. Fantastic right. series. Thanks. Big problem. Certainly something to think about. Thank Thanks, you, George. George. Sure. Well, Jevin. Can't you make it rain or snow somewhere? Well, or well you know we're going to try. We That's get, what we need. We might get a few drops with the system coming down here uh, Sunday morning, especially over the mountains. And yeah. actually, there could be a quick blast of snow. In fact, two quick blasts of snow for the Rocky Mountains, which is where we need it, as long as it's on the west side of the Rockies, so it hits this side of the continental divide. Meanwhile, the warmth continues not only in southern Nevada, but all over the west. Pictures out of Los Angeles today where downtown L.A. hit 91 degrees. San Fernando Valley in the lower 90s. Long Beach hit 93. It was 88 in Santa Monica. It was that kind of day, not only in Southern California, but Southern Nevada, too. Here's real-time neighborhood weather. First stop near Rhodes Ranch at Sierra Vista High School. They check in at 64 degrees with a very gentle breeze. Went right up to Valley View in Charleston at 65 right now. Another one of our 70 neighborhood weather stations will block off Water Street in downtown Henderson there at 63. And up near Rampart and Lake Mead in Summerlin, it's also 63 with 36% relative humidity. 68 on the Strip, 69 up in the northeast part of town. And down near Jones and Tropicana, there's still holding on to the big 7-0. The mountains dipped into the 30s, Pahrump at 62, while Boulder City and Searchlight come in at 66. How about those highs today? Look at all these neighborhoods that made it into the 80s, plenty of them, and where it didn't make it into the 80s, it was mid to upper 70s. Outside of town, the mountain at 62, Death Valley hit 80, but Sandy Valley and Laughlin led the way at 83. If you missed it earlier in the newscast, we did set a record today. 75 degrees with the top temperature, breaking the old mark set back in 1971 and 16 degrees above a normal. And not only was it a record for the day, it was the warmest January ever recorded, just shattering the previous direct, uh, record by nearly 3 degrees. Our air quality today was moderate. Some neighborhoods getting a little more dust thrown in the air, too. So that's another reason why we could use the rain. And not a whole lot of cold air as we look across the country. A lot of the northeast in the 30s, but the way things have been back there, that is mild. And go westward, look at that, still 70 in Phoenix at this hour. There is some snow falling, although it's falling on warmer land, so it's melting pretty quickly in parts of Indiana and Ohio. We've got some high, thin clouds out there now. They'll clear out over the next couple of hours, and we should see plenty of stars tonight. The changes come with this area of low pressure as it's diving southward. With it, it's bringing colder air wrapping around it as well. It comes in late tomorrow night. It'll kick up the wind significantly. You will really feel that, and it'll knock the temperature down from the mid-70s to right around normal, down around 60 for the high temperature. So here's your forecast for tonight. 49 degrees under a, uh, got a few high clouds now, but they'll clear out. Then tomorrow, look for the potential for another record. We're thinking 76. The record is 77. If the winds come in earlier enough, early enough, I should say, we will set a record high. And again, tomorrow, some neighborhoods easily into the 80s. If you're heading up to the mountain, look for a high of 59 after morning low, just barely dipping below freezing. And your seven-day forecast, there you go. Boy, I'll tell you, talk about falling off the ladder. 76 tomorrow, 62 and wind on Sunday. The wind dies down, but the temperature stays in the upper 50s to low 60s much of next week. It'll feel like February, which we probably won't be used to. And by the way, we were out and about earlier today, so let me say hello to some outstanding fifth graders. It was my pleasure to uh, join Oscar Goodman and be one of the guest speakers out of the D.A.R.E. graduation at Doris Reed Elementary, some of the finest fifth graders in all the land. And you know, some of the students get to read essays in front of that large group of students and, and uh, parents and teachers and everything. And a couple of them were a little nervous. One was so nervous she was in tears before oh. she started. Another one was so nervous she was giggling before oh, wow. it started. And both of them did great. Oh. So it was really Wonderful. fun to be there, yeah. You weren't in tears. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> I might be tomorrow, though. Thanks, Thank you, Kevin. Kevin.
Two Metro police officers testified today about a New Year's Eve shooting that left one man dead. Coming up, why the jury ruled that shooting was justified. Later on, laser surgery has helped millions get rid of their glasses. Now it could help seniors keep their eyesight. We'll show you how. And I'm Chris Matthews, UNLV in Wyoming, getting ready for Saturday's Duel in the Desert. High school star LeBron James getting ready for life without high school hopes. Plus, another day, another round of terrific golf shots. Sports is next here on Channel 8. We'll get ready for the good old-fashioned shootout at the MAC. UNLV is preparing for another conference war, this time against the Cowboys. Hey, lock and load, UNLV will be ready. We're just going to have to get out and run, you know, uh, try to make, um, you know, good plays on the uh, offense end and, you know, make sure we guard our man on defense and, you know, we should be fine. They're not similar at all. It's like a, a, a versus B. Uh, they're big and strong and, and want to get it inside a lot and uh, play a half-court game, and we prefer the full court, so we'll, we'll see how this thing works out. Coming up next half hour, a story on UNLV's guard who can't kick up his heels. It's Pack the Mac Night tomorrow. Five bucks gets you a seat. In the upper bowl, if you can't make it to the game, you can watch it on Las Vegas 1 beginning at 7.30. You won't be seeing high school phenom LeBron James playing high school hoops anymore. The Ohio High School Athletic Association ruled James ineligible for the rest of the season for accepting gifts. The future NBA first rounder was given jerseys in exchange for posing for pictures. The association says it's sending a message about fairness. Who would have guessed the Lakers would be 11 games behind the Kings at this point in the season? The two teams square off tonight in Sacramento. You know, you know the, what the Lakers got to do. Hey, I'd say just take it one at a time. We just take it a game at a time and see what happens. I mean, we come out here and win a nice game, then, you know, the Lakers are back. We lose tonight, tonight's game and it's the Lakers are back to being garbage. <laughs> so, you know, just take it a game at a time and just see what happens. Things for us have been slow this year, but, you know, hopefully we've improved some, you know, somewhat so that you know, we bring a better effort. All right, and finally, the PGA pros are swinging in California. That sunshine, the Bob Hope Classic, Chris DeMarco enjoying a birdie on 18. He shot a 66 today. He's a 10 under par. His little birdie, nothing compared to Steve Lowry's shot on the sixth hole at Indian Wells. He's tied for sixth as they hit into the weekend because he's got himself. Oh, the ace. Hole in one. Lowry is at 14 under. Everybody is chasing Stephen Ames, who is chasing his first PGA Tour win. Ames leads the field at 22 under par. Just once in my lifetime would I like to see an ace. <laughs> like to even see one. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. There is more news straight ahead on Channel 8 Eyewitness News Live at 6.30. Coroner's inquest looked into a New Year's Eve officer-involved shooting today that left one man dead. We'll tell you why the jury ruled the way it did. A new laser treatment for a common disease that robs seniors of their sight. That's in tonight's medical breakthroughs. And a combination of magic and comedy is making an amazing career for the amazing Jonathan. Kate Maddox will introduce us to him in tonight. Eye on entertainment. You're watching Channel 8 Eyewitness News at 6.30 with Paula Francis, Gary Waddell, Neighborhood Weather with Kevin Jennison, and Sports with Chris Matthews. Channel 8 Eyewitness News, the news leader. Thanks for staying with us. A coroner's jury today ruled that two Metro police officers were justified when they shot and killed a robbery suspect on New Year's Eve. 34-year-old Bobby Nussbaum was shot and killed after the robbery of a Bank of America branch on North Nellis. Channel 8 Eyewitness News reporter Cindy Caesar was at today's inquest. I yelled to my partner. I said, gun, gun, gun. It was at this apartment complex where officers Bill Guzman and Joel Cranford found the suspicious vehicle. And inside that car were Bobby Nussbaum and Taylor Maxey, suspects in a robbery at this bank just moments before. Maxey fled before Nussbaum shot Officer Gooseman in his leg. At this point, he was turning to his right very quickly, and from my point of view, it looked like he was going for the passenger side door to get out. From the way he was turning, the way the gun was coming around, it was at that point that I felt that my life was in imminent jeopardy. When he was on the ground with the gun pointed up, I, I began to fire, and as soon as the gun came down and fell across him and was no longer pointing at me or my partner, that's when I quit firing, sir. Nussbaum was hit 13 times yes, and died at the scene. Day. Maxie was, was caught moments car. later. Kathy Nussbaum, the suspect's wife, says her husband had been high on drugs for two months, and she tried to stop him from hurting himself or else. 
After the inquest ruling, Officer Guzman's family cried in relief while comforting Nussbaum's widow on her loss. The alleged getaway driver, Taylor Maxey, is here in custody at the Clark County Detention Center. He is being charged with the second-degree murder of Bobby Nussbaum because Nussbaum was killed during the commission of a crime in which Maxey is charged. But Maxey's attorney will argue that today's ruling of a justified killing by police means that Maxey cannot be charged with murder. Cindy Caesar, Channel 8 Eyewitness News. Taylor Maxey's preliminary hearing is scheduled for Monday. He faces life in prison if convicted of Nussbaum's murder. Police don't believe the 23-year-old who was found dead in her apartment last night was murdered. The body was found last evening in the Camelot Apartments near Tropicana and Maryland Parkway. Police are now awaiting toxicology reports from the coroner's office to determine the cause of her death. The woman's one-year-old son, whom you saw there, was in the apartment alone with the body. He is now in the custody of Child Protective Services. They're looking for relatives of the woman and the boy. So if relatives identify themselves, then our first job is to see if there are appropriate relative placements. If their home is suitable, um, we can do background checks, we do home checks to make sure that we're not placing the child in any jeopardy. The one-year-old is said to be in good health. Officials say a new law allowing mothers to leave newborn babies at specified places with no questions asked is saving lives. Nevada passed the Safe Haven Law in 2001. Child advocates say three mothers have surrendered unwanted newborns since the law passed. Officials say during the five years before the law, six unwanted babies had been dumped or killed by parents. While that law may be helping infants, a study, show, a study shows another trend in Nevada is not. Nevada ranks second worst in the nation for mothers receiving late or no prenatal care. Some Las Vegas doctors say the low ranking is due to low-income women having a hard time getting Medicaid and finding obstetricians. Doctors say poor women do not have enough access to prenatal care programs. Police hope a new unexpected turn will help them on the path to finding a California woman who disappeared on Christmas Eve. The investigation is now being expanded beyond California. Chris Lawrence has the latest on the disappearance of Lacey Peterson. The search for Lacey Peterson has detoured to Longview, Washington, where a grocery clerk thinks she saw the missing pregnant woman. We hope to be able to pick the days when she was working. Police have been reviewing the store's surveillance tapes from last month, and officers will advise the Modesto police if they find anything. All probability, this is, uh, this is not going to work out, but you never know, and we are going to take it seriously. The clerk says a young pregnant woman passed through her checkout line and said, this is serious. I was kidnapped. Call the authorities when I leave. When an older man joined her in line and asked what they were talking about, she told him, she said, you kidnapped her. And when the clerk made a joke about it, the man laughed and said, yeah, I guess I kidnapped her. The clerk intended to call police immediately, but got distracted and forgot until news reports jogged her memory. No one has seen Lacey Peterson since Christmas Eve when her husband Scott says she went out to walk the dog. I had nothing to do with Lacey's disappearance. Scott says he was fishing a couple hours away, but police haven't found anyone to verify that. And it later came out that he was having an affair with a woman who didn't know Scott was married. I am very sorry for Lacey's family and the, the pain that this has caused. Police have not named a suspect in Lacey's disappearance, but haven't ruled out her husband. And if she's alive, Lacey is due to have the baby in about two weeks. Chris Lawrence, CBS News. Earlier this week, Scott Peterson did say he believes his, his wife is alive and is being held against her will. President Bush met with his closest ally as the clock ticks down for Saddam Hussein to cooperate with the United Nations. Here's tonight's top national stories. The president met with British Prime Minister Tony Blair for two hours at the White House today. President Bush says the process to decide what action to take to disarm Iraq should not be dragged out. Blair agrees. Saddam Hussein is not cooperating with the inspectors and therefore is in breach of the UN resolution. And that's why time is running out. Thousands of troops in Kuwait could soon be on the move now that the nation of Turkey says it's willing to allow U.S. troops on bases there. Weapons inspectors are due to give another report to the United Nations on February 14th. Hussein says he wants to meet with inspectors before that. A man who hijacked a mail truck during...
robbery and then led police on a slow speed chase throughout the city he is in custody tonight. Police surrounded a mail truck in the middle of a busy intersection in Miami-Dade County. Negotiators then got the man to release his female hostage. Short time later, the man surrendered. No one was hurt, but the man faces a myriad of state and federal charges that could put him behind bars for life. The Red Cross now says blood supplies in the Atlanta area are not dangerous. The Red Cross had sent out a warning that blood may have been contaminated due to the presence of unidentified white particles. Elective surgeries were canceled and backup blood supplies had to be used for emergencies. The Red Cross now says it has found and isolated all of the possibly contaminated blood. It's working to find out where those white particles came from. Coming up on Channel 8 Eyewitness News Live at 6.30 in Medical Breakthroughs, the new tool giving hope to some patients suffering from a common and blinding eye condition, dry macular degeneration. Plus, entertainment reporter Kate Maddox gives us the scoop on another magician hitting the strip to amaze audiences. And Kevin Janison will have the details of some changes in the forecast for the weekend as we wrap up the warmest January on record. Currently, up to 35% of people over the age of 75 have the blinding condition macular degeneration. Most have the dry form of the disease, which has no proven treatment. In tonight's medical breakthroughs, we see how a new laser might finally offer some hope. John Tyne and his wife Prudence enjoy their trips down memory lane. If John had not been in the right place at the right time, he might not have been able to see these pictures. First doctor said I had macular degeneration generation said it could be very serious. Dr. Greg Fox had a different response. He told John there was help. It's very easy treatment. It takes us about 15 minutes to do. That treatment is this laser. It gently heats the retinal pigment epithelium, the tissue that contains harmful deposits called drusen. That heating and damaging of the retinal pigment epithelium causes the body to come in and uh, do some repair work. And at the same time, we notice some of these drusen can disappear and decrease in size and number and thickness. Dr. Fox says the treatment is for those with the dry form of the disease. He hopes this can decrease the number of people who go on to develop the more serious wet form. We could decrease the incidence of patients going on to wet macular degeneration by the order of 100,000 patients or more per year. John had the treatment and is surprised with the results. The eye that uh, they did the work on is better than the other one now. Over time, he's learned to appreciate the little things in life. It's wonderful to be able to get around every day, see people and things and enjoy life. With his vision intact, he's staying one step ahead of Mother Nature. The treatment is only for people who have the dry form of macular degeneration and it is not yet readily available. A study of more than 800 people is currently underway after final results are in and the treatment proves to be better. Dr. Fox says it could then be a treatment that insurance companies would likely pay for. For more information, send us a self-addressed stamped envelope and write macular laser on the front. You can get more information as well from our website. The FDA has approved a new way to treat psoriasis. The itchy skin disease affects millions of Americans. About one and a half million have a moderate to severe form. The new drug is unique because it targets immune cells. Doctors believe psoriasis is caused when the immune system goes haywire and causes inflammation of the skin. And that's tonight's medical breakthroughs, Gary. Very good. Mm -hmm. The amazing Jonathan combines comedy and magic for one of the funniest shows in Las Vegas. And now there's a new place for you to catch that show. Kate Maddox joins us now with that in tonight's Eye on Entertainment. Kate. He's packed up the stand-up stuff, and now he seems to have found a a permanent place in Las Vegas, which is great. His show is now over at the Flamingo after having spent two successful years downtown. He's even got the big new I've Made It mansion. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing Jonathan has spent close to 25 years on the road as a stand-up comedian slash magician. Living out of suitcases, though, was getting old, and Jonathan was ready for a real home. I lived at the, at, at the Nugget for two years inside the hotel room, and uh, it was fun, but it didn't feel like home. When you get payments like the ones coming in for this place, it feels like home. <laughs> Uh, payments shouldn't be a problem. Amazing Jonathan has a new deal at the Flamingo. 
prime strip property for a new show featuring gross-out gag humor. The kind of stuff that once earned Jonathan the nickname the Freddy Krueger of comedy. We have a lot of kids being yanked out of my show in the first half hour. I see kids getting their arms pulled out of their sockets from their moms. In the first minute of the show, he stabs his lovely assistant Penny in the head. So what's a passion for Amazing Jonathan when he's not taking time out from fake blood and all that? He likes computer graphics and animation. He even designs his own billboards. That's what I do when I'm not doing this. I'm, on, I'm probably on my computer 12, 13 hours a day just because I want to be. Anything else ever earned him a buck? I was a male stripper for a while. Uh, I still do that once in a while. Uh, what are you laughing at, Kate? Okay, but it's his style of comedy that has earned Jonathan a loyal, if slightly off-center, following. It's all in his philosophy. To, to do and say anything that you want to do, knowing that it's a comedy show and I'm not serious, and if you can't deal with that... On Monday, we'll show you more of Amazing Jonathan's life as we take a tour of his home. And trust me, there's quite a bit of interesting stuff in there. Oh. You shouldn't miss it. That'll be on Monday on Eyewitness News Live at 6.30. Oh,